Thank you very much. We're going to continue on time, I hope. Um, so for those of you I haven't met, I'm Prue Mitchell from Wikimedia Australia. I'm really um, thrilled to get the privilege to introduce to you um, our next two speakers who are um, working on a project with Wikimedia Australia on our behalf. Um, so it's fantastic that they've agreed to come and share that for the first time with our community, uh, commissioning people, as well as with uh, the larger group for Worlds of Wikimedia. So um, very quickly, because they're going to tell you more about themselves, but um, Kirsten Thorpe is from the Jumbunna Institute at um, the University of Technology, Sydney, which is where we'll all be going this evening. So uh, you can talk to her, ask her about that. Um, and Nathan Sentence, who is currently at um, the Powerhouse Museum, if um, any of you have been able to explore and find a really great place, to, a museum in Sydney, um, he'll talk, he can um, fill you in on that as well. But they're going to talk to us about First Nations knowledge protocols for description and access, which is a very important topic uh, to all of us and with a particular Australian slant today. So I'll leave you two to uh, do more. Thank you very much. I'll stay here. Thank you. You're a man in the game. Nathan sends you a nari. Where are you giving a ballad? In the Malaja, Garago, Norumbango. In the Malaja, Garago, Mujigangu. In the Malaja, Nari, Mujigangu. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Garago people and pay my respects to their elders past and present and uh, recognize that in a space of talking about you know, history or storytelling, that uh, history here has been since time and memoriam. And um, the custodians of that history and these lands are the Gadigal people, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So thanks for having us here for the conference. Um, as Prue mentioned, Nathan and I are going to talk about the work that we're doing with Wikimedia Australia. I'm a little bit under the weather, but want to let people know that I have taken a PCR test and I'm not COVID positive, um, just in, in case I start coughing a little. Um, but we're thrilled to be here um, to present our work. Um, really interested to have conversations with you all and um, yeah, thankful for the opportunity to connect with your network. Um, we're going to talk a little bit first. Nathan and I, when we present together, we like to say that it is relaxed. We like to um, also use yarning as an approach in our work. So we're going to share our conversation with you today um, as we go through the slides. And I think we might introduce ourselves first and sort of talk about how we came to this work and what our interests are. Yeah, um, so I'm Nathan Mujisens, I'm a Wiradjuri man. Um, my family is traditionally from Mudgee, New South Wales, but I grew up on Darkinjung country on the New South Wales Central Coast and sort of have, uh, I guess, communal responsibilities to uh, the community off the Central Coast. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I love introducing myself because I think it's a great way for, it's sort of like in an Aboriginal relational way of you to understand me so you can understand the background of why I think why I think and how I've come to know what I know. And I think that's an important thing of like, I guess, because I work, I primarily work in libraries, archives and museums, uh, formerly a librarian, now work at the Powerhouse Museum. And I think in that space, there's a lot of trying to pretend as if the knowledge in these spaces exists within a vacuum or the way we tell things exist in a vacuum. As you can see in my shirt, museums are not, uh, have never been neutral and not neutral. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I guess, you know, working in these spaces, and even beforehand, I think growing up, you know, you know the things that uh, Aboriginal community members are telling you differ from the mainstream narratives that you hear within, like, I guess, the media or within history books or even the class, you know, the classes you take, you feel that there's a disconnect between um, the lived experiences of community in there. And I think that sort of is why I work in the space we do in thinking about sort of representation and, you know, um, and I guess like, you know, uh, like talking about like, I guess erasure is one of the issues that can happen a lot with these spaces. Um, thinking about even where I work at the powerhouse, there's a lot of, uh, talk about first, so they'll, you know, they'll usually say the first um, person to, um, to do this in Australia, or the first Australian, when they sort of mean the first, um, you know, Australian of uh, most likely European background, or like, even like the powerhouse itself has a long history of documenting the history of the Sydney 
the Sydney train network. Like it's actually one of the big industries that uh, you know we have the history of. But the way it talks about it almost erases how much of that is connected to the Redfern community and the Aboriginal community of Redfern. So I've seen the erasure that can happen in these uh, knowledge spaces and and also to the damage of uh, people outside your community representing your community. You know, I always think about when I first started at the Australian Museum, I uh, looked, they digitised all the Australian Museum magazine, which was like kind of like a general publication, but it was written by museum staff. And that was between the 1920s and 1960s. So I was reading these digitised copies and there was one article from 1921 that um, stuck out to me. They were all really horrible every time they would write about Aboriginal people, but this article was saying, like, this 1921 article that was written by one of the head anthropologists here at University of Sydney, um, who was, you know, a guest writing for the Australian Museum, said that grown Aboriginal men and women have the minds of small children. And, of course, that's false, but if you consider, like, the general public that would have received that, they would have received it from uh, the oldest museum in Australia, the sixth oldest natural history museum in the world, written by the head anthropologist at the University of Sydney. They would see that as fact, and that can be, you know, and it has, you know, consequences uh, with representation, not just because of, if you think about the same time, the protection um, policy practices were happening at the same time. So if you were, uh, you know, uh, a non-Indigenous Australian that was reading from, quote unquote, experts that Aboriginal, grown Aboriginal men and women uh, have the minds of small children, but at the same time hearing about Aboriginal children being taken away from their families, you would almost think that is justified. So I guess that's sort of the th influences that have got me into this space and sort of thinking about this sort of topic. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so as introductions for myself, um, as Prue mentioned, my name's Kirsten Thorpe. Um, my family are Waramai people from Port Stephens in New South Wales. So, um, you know, a couple of hours north of Sydney, um, and I guess, you know, for me, entering these spaces, I think I'll really echo what Nathan has talked about. Um, I've been trained as an archivist, um, you know, a student of sociology before going to archival studies. Um, I'm also a, a sort of trained librarian, but I think all of that as background has given me um, an ability to be around those systems and structures of how information and knowledge are created and also seeing the way that power is man manifested through those structures. Um, so I guess a lot of my work has been to reconsider those power structures, reconsider how information is disseminated and try as much as possible to think about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation in those processes. So. I think our work with Wikimedia, what we've tried to do and as we explain the project is to draw on our expertise and understanding from being in institutional context where that power is yielded um, and engaging with community in a way that often, as Nathan said, the narratives that are in a community context aren't represented within those power structures. So I think Wikipedia, Nathan and I sort of talk about it's a really interesting sort of intersection for us. It's you know, we have to sort of acknowledge it's not our day-to-day -day work thinking about Wikipedia, but it's a really important topic for us. And, you know, the more that we even talk with our colleagues about representation on Wikipedia, I think that everyone is sort of saying, oh, yeah, right, we need to be there too. So I think today is a bit of a conversation about our project and thinking, well, what might those steps be in this work? So a little bit about the project. Um, as Prue mentioned... Um, we're working with Wikimedia Australia to look at questions of First Nations metadata. And I think we've been thinking broadly about metadata across descriptive practices, across classification. And I think even in our kind of forming of this exploratory work, we're also questioning ourselves about what those things mean and what they mean in different contexts, which I think has been quite powerful and useful in us kind of testing our assumptions about, you know, wh when we're talking about metadata, where's it coming from, who's it created by. Um, Prue mentioned really briefly that um, coming from Jambana Research at UTS and just, I guess, to communicate in terms of the academic space that we work in and how we've engaged Nathan as a collaborator in this is really... Um, coming from an Indigenous standpoint, using Indigenous research methodologies in our work, but centering all the time the position of Aboriginal self-determination and sovereignty in our work. So we have a really unique 
Research Institute in that we both engage with the academic disciplines that we are situated in, um, but we're also really in interested in how that work hits the ground in industry. Um, so I'll go to the next slide, Nathan. Just talking a little bit more um, about the project and the methodologies that we've used, we really recognise that this is such um, an enormous topic and we wanted, um, as we're sort of foregrounded, to draw on our expertise to look at this question of um, First Nations representation and metadata. So it's exploratory, it is a review of literature, we're not going out and collecting any new data in our process, but we're, as a research team, drawing on methods such as collaborative yarning, and yarning is used as a um, indigenous research method that bring a process that brings um, relational um, communication and bringing insight through conversation into topics. So um, it's interesting because I think we want our scope, you know, sometimes we have to keep bringing ourselves back to well, what is realistic. Um, but I think some of the principles that are on screen around, you know, centering indigenous voice, um, thinking about agency all the time are at the core of what we're thinking about with this project. Yeah, and I guess one of the ways we're sort of grounding it is through uh, the Atsalan Protocol. So uh, just a bit of background about Atsalan, you know, they're the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Library Information Resource Network. So they were founded in the, um, you know, the uh, early 1990s. Um, so, you know, to support uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people within the, the library space in Australia, as well as supporting um, mob being able to access the services and collections within um, library and archives. And as part of that, they developed in 1995 these protocols, um, and which were re revised in um, 2012 to incorporate the digital environment. You know, in that, in that time, the of digitization was starting to commence, so they wanted to sort of talk about that. And they touch on a range of different subjects, as you can sort of see. Um, but the protocols themselves are sort of well, they do have, they offer a lot of guidance. They are sort of, uh, you know, things that can offer guidance. They are designed to be used by all types of libraries. Uh, so they are not particularly prescriptive. So they are designed, because they're designed for, to be used by regional libraries as well as sort of big institutional libraries. But their uh, impact is, they are quite groundbreaking, you know. Um, they very much influence the work I've done. I think a lot of Aboriginal librarians have done and they, um, you know, the, some people may be familiar with the NAGPRA, princip, uh, NAGPRA protocols in uh, North America that sort of um, guide Native American um, repatriation. And they were very much influenced by the Atsalan protocols and came out roughly around the same time. And uh, uh, the University of Sydney Library also developed some cultural protocols a couple of years ago and the Atsalan protocols themselves were very much uh, a big connection to that. So we're sort of looking at that, but we're very much particularly looking at proto um, the protocol five around uh, you know, description and classification. And I think these protocols were really as, um, and I think the, I'm not sure if people can see it, but the Mick Dobson quote at the top, I think is a very sort of powerful quote to think about when you're thinking about how, especially for us in libraries, thinking about how how welcome we can be when we have particular resources um, on our shelves. Um, and, but I think classification description is incredibly important. Uh, you know, classification historically, especially in the places that me and Kirsten have worked, have contributed to like sort of the subjugation of indigenous knowledges historically. Like um, even while I was still working, you know, uh, Aboriginal creation stories would be under like uh, 394.20994, which was uh, Aboriginal, it would be Australian myths and legends. So you can see that even Aboriginal creation stories were um, subjugated and sort of talked about as mythology or, or Australian folklore um, compared to other creation stories. Uh, and even at the Australian Museum, different sort of situation, but you know, everything that kind of looks like a shield, when it came into the Australian Museum collection was called a shield. And I like, you know, I'm on a language learning journey, so I don't know all the Wiradjuri words for shield, but I know that there's at least five of them. And there's like even one that I know that's called like Gira Gira, uh, Giran Giran, which Giran means wind. So it kind of, it means wind, wind, which 
um, you know, a place like Wagga is called Wagga Wagga. Um, Wagga actually means dance. So Wagga Wagga actually means place of celebration um, or dance. So uh, thinking about that with that shield, I know that it's something much more complex than something than to just protect oneself with. But I, once it has come into that space, I guess that classification has sort of override its sort of meaning. So I, we think about classification a lot. And also classification is a way um, for mob to find the information that's within, held within, like, especially libraries, archives, museums, in the cultural institutions, you know. Um, you know, knowing that stuff is uh, radry helps people find it when they're looking in these places. So I think those sort of classification descriptions is also about sort of, um, you know, um, mob, um, being um, their right to know what about um, their, what is about them in these spaces, um, it's basically trying to adhere to that right by helping with the classification. Thanks, Nathan. So we're going to pop up um, basically what are the questions that we've been exploring in this project, and there's quite a few. Um, but basically, as Nathan has outlined with that to learn protocols, we've basically um, have a couple of sort of prompt questions for each protocol to work through. So I'm going to read some of these out um, related to the protocols. So the first is, um, what should Wikidata editors know about using national indigenous thesauri in their modelling of items and elements relating to First Nations peoples, languages, place names and bibliographic items in an Australian context? Um, the second is, what guidance can Wikimedia Australia give Wikipedia Wikipedia editors to improve the cultural appropriateness of categories, articles, um, article short description and content related to First Nations peoples, languages, place and culture. So really, I think as Nathan talked about, you know, the sort of um, the detail of the classification. Um, then there's a focus more on the engagement. So what kind of Wikipedia articles and Wikidata items should be prioritised for the community to review and update? And what kind of strategies can Wikimedia Australia use to ensure a First Nations perspective in these priorities? Um, we then sort of turn to the question of the metadata structures and schemas and, you know, the, the people that are, um, you know, organising these. So the next question is, how can Wikimedia Australia work with other metadata organisations to improve access to appropriate classificatory systems? and ge geographic language and cultural identifiers, ensuring that custodianship of these identifiers remain with the people they describe. Um, so that's a pretty big one um, in itself. And how do Wikimedia Australia collaborate with other metadata organisations to facilitate maximum consultation nationally without undue time commitment from First Nations communities? And then finally, um, how do Wikimedia Australia build partnerships with other state-based and regional libraries, archives, who are able to engage directly with their local communities um, in a way that will benefit all parties? So they're, they're broad questions. Um, and we, um, you know, as we've approached this, we've gone into the full exploratory mode, um, reviewing literature. We can't imagine that we're going to answer any of these, but our, you know, our pursuit is to look at well, what is the literature that exists. Um, so looking, you know, across scholarly literature, but also, um, you know, digging into websites and other reports that have been done. So if there are things that um, after we finish that you can pass on to us, we'd really appreciate that too. And I think what we've found so far is that we've prompted more questions. So what Nathan and I are going to do now is. Um, go through some of the early findings as we basically start to chart out what, what we imagine to be a discussion paper um, in the context of that literature. And I think what, what it will shape up as being is sort of that mapping out of detail, but also putting those next round of questions um, really at the forefront with our work and recognising um, other really significant work um, with Heather, with the ARC happening um, making sure that this is just a start. It's a, a little spark, I guess, in that. Uh, so we're going to run through the findings. Do you want to take this one, Nathan? Yeah, yeah. sure. And I think, um, yeah, what, what we've put up there is um, Auslang. You may be familiar with it. Uh, Does anyone know about Auslang? Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. So it's a, it's a thesaurus around uh, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. Um, so it basically sort of helps uh, sort of map Aboriginal languages. It's 
based on a lot of, uh, I guess, anthropological resources. So, and because of that, it is in some cases contested, but it's one of the most prominent of its type. Uh, and one of the good things about it, I think me and Kirsten were just talking before we started about uh, the fact that it has been, um, even though it's been contested, it has been dynamic. They have, um, once they um, find more resources or have community reach out, they have been updating this as it goes. But it has been one of the, I guess it's probably one of the most nationally recognized thesauruses to sort of, um, you know, map uh, Aboriginal cultural, uh, especially languages within um, cultural institutions, yeah. And so what we know from talking to people is that a lot of people talk about in terms of engaging with First Nations material on Wikipedia um, and in the Wikimedia context that a lot of people are afraid of getting things wrong. And so even when we started to explore this question around the National Thesaurus tools is that we recognise that there's a major gap, apart from Osling, um, in people having guidance. And what we are sort of seeing and recommending is um, much more investment in participatory tools that actually, like um, Oslang, enable this kind of layering of context around naming and description. Um, so, for example, if um, in a language context a community hasn't been documented or there is documentation and there are different ways of spelling or naming that that's actually um, citable and people can go and look at the history of that naming. So we really see, um, and one of those first findings is um, that there's a real need for subject um, and other descriptive information to be done in the same way as an Oslang type of database. And that in the context of information production and looking at, you know, the systems that um, were affected by colonisation, that we actually need to have um, thesauri tools that go from the national to the local. And so how we embed local ways of knowing is really important in that work. But we kind of see Osling as a, Osling as a bit of an exemplar in that work. So the second was really thinking about this idea of guidance for Wikipedia, Wikipedia editors. And, you know, one of the first things that we've been thinking through is um, the building of critical information literacy skills. And, you know, the dominance of settler narratives on Wikipedia is just so profound. So thinking all the time about, um, you know, building people's skills around the relevancy and appropriateness of resources, it's stuff that we all know. Um, but thinking about positionality in terms of the production of material and we sort of, in our conversations with um, Prue and the team, we've sort of started thinking about, well, where are the sites that knowledge is produced and what participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had in that process and I guess having some frameworks that get people to um, get comfortable with that and understand um, both in descriptive practices that there needs to be a, a, a focus on Indigenous agency in that. Um, and up on the screen, I was sort of looking at the representation of where my community are from and the description of where are my people and everything that is on that page is a settler narrative. It's written from the view of the anthropologists that went to Port Stephens. Um, it is really limited in what it shows. And I think there's been gesturally um, an approach that, you know, it's kind of like it's trying to get there, but it, it isn't from my view a way that the community would ever rep represent themselves. It doesn't um, give agency or name people in that process as well. It's sort of still that um, kind of settler narrative being imposed. So we see that as being really important, the information literacy piece. Um, we wanted to mention that, you know, this work is happening in sort of glam spaces and the leadership of IATSIS, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies in Canberra, I think, is really important in this. And IATSIS, just in the last couple of months, have um, produced a guide to evaluating and selecting education resources. And it's really effective and powerful because it's talking about, well, if this book was published, if this source has been published, what was the participation of community? Is it the dominance of material being written about communities? So it's kind of got the structure of um, four mob or by mob, for mob, or about mob. And I think some of those things will really start to get people thinking about that. So I encourage you to have a look at that a little bit more. Um, so the other thing, I guess, you know, in looking at the literature, the whole conversation about filling the gap, um, Nathan and I have sort of, and our colleague Lauren, um, who I should mention is part of the project, 
sort of thinking about that idea of well, why would people want to be in the wiki spaces? So I think sometimes even in an Aboriginal community context, silence is used as a way um, to say to people, we don't want to participate. And I think the, the construct of filling the gap is one that we shouldn't be looking for. And, and so in us thinking about those Indigenous research methodologies, we've been thinking about, um, yeah, getting people involved. Um, so we have these questions, um, you know, thinking about who are the editors, um, how might consent be considered in a Wikipedia context, um, how if Indigenous people from an Australian perspective are engaging, um, how would people consider their knowledge to be safe in a Wikipedia context, um, what's appropriate to be shared and by who, and what kind of information protocols might need to be established. These are all things that in a, um, an Indigenous knowledge framework are considered as the core parts of transmission and thinking about um, knowledge being used and cared for for future generations. So if we put that into the Wikipedia context, thinking about, well, what, what accountability, what kind of processes do we need to think about, um, I think is really important. And the consultation piece we'll touch on a little bit at the end, but... I think just building that participation is actually a different paradigm to the filling the gap com conversation. Yeah, and I 100% and like, you know, we'll, we've, we're both in the space of like data sovereignty. And I think that will influence our work. And, but I also do like how you and Lauren have approached this where I think there has been that, I think you, as you said, filling the gaps and we sort of um, taught, I, I love how you know, one of the things we're trying to do the challenge with in Wikipedia is, I guess, even thinking about not just like terminology, but like, I guess, deficit discourse. And I think um, it's looking for, rather than looking at it in a deficit angle, it's like, what are the opportunities? And yeah, but also too, like, how do we create those structures within not sort of knowledge? Yeah. So kind of related to what Nathan was saying then was thinking about, um, how Indigenous research principles would be affected um, in a Wikimedia context. And one of the biggest principles in an Indigenous research frame, and, and that kind of goes to knowledge production, is thinking about relational accountability. Um, so we were thinking about, well, what would participation truly look like um, in terms of planning to have relational accountability? Um, and also thinking about in representation on pages, um, how do people respond to information that is harmful and seeing Wikipedia actually sometimes being a destructive tool once information is there, it can be reproduced. We've got other sort of political um, and social things like native title that really impact communities. So in terms of land reclamation, um, this work becomes really serious. So um, we've been thinking about those governance structures and you know how that privilege and um, is sort of intervened in and working on the principle of do no harm. And on the screen are some um, Indigenous research principles um, around a model um, built by Archibald around Indigenous story work. So we've been thinking about these ideas of um, the story work principles of respect, reverence, reverence uh, responsibility, reciprocity, holism, interrelatedness and synergy, how would they operate in a context where information is flowing in much different ways? How can we um, ensure that those kind of principles um, that mean everything in a process way to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are actually um, embedded in that work? So, yeah, I am, um, you know, trying to uh, help as much as I can with this project. Um, as I, I'm a massive user of Wikipedia, but I'm not actually, I only just in the last year have become an editor. So one of the things I, one of the things I wanted to do was actually see what would happen if I created um, this page here, which has not been published yet, like it's, uh, it's up for review, uh, is off my great grandmother. Um, so I wanted to do that. And I did think it was interesting that the first thing Wikipedia asks is, are you connected to the subject? And I thought about that as like, and I can understand why that's a question, you know, it's a way to stop sort of corporates from, you know, self-propagating their own sort of propaganda. But for me, uh, you know, thinking about those indigenous principles, responsibility is a big one. And uh, being connected to the subject actually is one of the ways that I'm actually, means I'm much more accountable to my community. I have much more responsibility to tell the story right. So I don't think um, that is a 
detriment to sort of uh, knowledge creation. And I think, you know, thinking about, uh, I guess, like thinking about like authoritative sources and, um, you know, working with community and being part of community actually should not be, uh, I guess, like a detriment, but more for like, it's actually a positive, yeah. So our final sort of early finding that we wanted to share before we sort of have some um, summing up points is just thinking about um, the concept of data governance and decision making in a, um, a wiki context. And um, I know sort of as Nathan and I have been talking more and more um, about this work, speaking to colleagues um, in our team and people who have had pages created on them and in a community context and feeling really... Um, both sort of mortified that there've been pages created on their work because they feel like in their community they're sort of big noting themselves or there's been no participation in informed consent. And I think as Nathan and I have given that um, background, information has been used as a weapon against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, um, you know, whether it's from government or the anthropologists or there's there's been such a system and a, and a tool of... Um, information being used against people. So even the act of trying to raise the profile of people who might have um, publicly accessible material still doesn't give them the time to, to go home and say to their family in that relational accountability, hey, there's going to be stuff about me. It doesn't mean that... So there's, there's no extra context of them being able to say, you know, I learnt all this stuff from my aunt or my grandmother. There's sort of just this um, stepping into a place that I think makes people really uncomfortable. So... I think thinking about informed consent all the time is also really important. Um, and as Nathan mentioned, just as the final point, um, thinking about the Indigenous data sovereignty movement and what that means um, in a wiki context, I think is really important. So I might just do my sort of quick summing up and then hand over to Nathan. Um, I hope that those early findings are um, food for thought for you. We, we realise in us engaging in this topic that we're actually generating more questions than answering anything. Um, but really appreciate the opportunity of coming here and speaking to you. And I guess Nathan and I, one of the things that we're trying to grasp in terms of our work is we've seen the damage of that weaponisation um, in the context of GLAM and we're always thinking about well, where are the new sites of power or where are the, the sites that will perpetuate that harm and how might, might we transfer some of those skills over? Um, so thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. Who I have no idea of time, so I don't know if we've got time for questions. Uh, great yarn. Um, I know that there have been some efforts by the legacy um, anthropological collections to... Um, reflect restrictions on some forms of traditional knowledge, like they might have gendered um, access to particular collections, for example. Um, are there similar efforts underway in any Wikimedia projects? Um, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, we always sort of use the exemplar of the Noongar work that's happened, um, but my feeling is that even the... Um, the institutions, like the GLAM context, hasn't got that stuff right at the moment. There's so much thinking that from the debates of, you know, I think the data sovereignty movement is probably saying that, um, you know, the institutions are now embedding these protocols and they're stopping research happening. But for me, it's actually a, a time of holding space saying we need to think through, well, what are the processes with this? So, I mean, the my one thing as a response to the question is you wouldn't want that material to be made accessible um, in a Wikipedia context if the harm is there to um, further dislocate communities. Um, you know, to know that stuff is in institutions I think is complex in itself, but to be on a platform in that way would be even more damaging. Hi, I'm um, interested. I've been heavily involved with the Noongar work um, and what I was wondering is people having that authority to speak and to give the information, how do you capture that type of situation where you can have a location with four or five different people with different stories and who has the authority to speak about it? And then the other side of the equation, when you record something or record knowledge, 
you're fixing it in a point in time rather than you're taking away that oral piece of tradition and letting knowledge grow and develop. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I guess uh, that's one of the challenges that we even are thinking about with, say, like the National Thesaurus is, uh, I guess, the contested nature, but also the fact that uh, there's a, we need to embed dynamicism. And I think that's one of the problems with uh, recording information. And that's why I still see even yarning with a lot of mob uh, why they want to embed things like data sovereignty. And I think one of the things I see a lot is mob wanting the ability to, which I guess is a, a difficult, uh, again, it's probably more of a, I guess, a question rather than I'm having an answer, but mob wanting that space to have the right to withdraw. Like, because generationally, the governance around that information may change. Like, I, I even know working at the powerhouse, there was, uh, we created an education kit that was uh, with local elders, and the local elders were involved in making it, but the generation that followed them basically have said that that information should be um, secret, sacred. And, what, and it was, and they were just thinking about the different, you could argue that there was informed consent, but the power dynamics at these different periods of time have shifted and the community feel like much stronger that they can say no to being that information being out. So I guess it's, yeah, it's, it's trying to create space for, because um, I, I do believe um, informed consent is not everlasting. So it is, it is a negotiation that should be uh, changing. And I guess with contested knowledge, uh, I can't, and of course this will be something we examine, but I know from a GLAM standpoint, we are trying to embed sort of um, pluralism into our collection so that, uh, you know, mob uh, from, that may, you know, as you were saying, like may um, all be traditional owners of one um, cultural site can tell all their stories. Um, and we don't, we at the, you know, at, in museums are not saying which one is right or wrong. It's just the community's different perspectives. And the only thing I would add to Nathan's comments is that that's why we've had such a strong focus on, you know, what does relational accountability mean? Because that means that things are dynamic and they change. And, you know, one thing for me is, um, and with places like Wikipedia, thinking about um, how community can be empowered to have that tool so that they can be the makers of that dynamic, um, those sites being dynamic. And so there's a whole other question of that engagement. But I think the concept of relational accountability gets back to, we're actually talking about two fundamentally different paradigms of knowledge dissemination. And there are opportunities there to think about them, but we have to get some back to some of them core things like, um, yeah, people knowing different stories in different places in different ways. And the question of authority, um, it, yeah, it all becomes very wishy-washy in that. Um, in that work and thinking about things being living. Um, but I think for me it is that empowerment for people to be able to tell their own stories or be engaged in that dialogue. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, sort of a question and a comment. I wrote a report for the Wikimedia Foundation about having sort of trusted knowledge, you know, creating standardised data and structured data about Aboriginal knowledge systems and I think one of the issues was like you said about not being able to cite or reference something like oral tradition and that challenge but my question here to the whole community is what sort of struck me is that Wikimedia and to an extent the museum cultures of Western European traditions treat living knowledge systems a little bit like butterflies and you catch them in a net and you lay them out dead in a glass case and categorize them but as a knowledge system, indigenous knowledges are a bit more resilient than our servers uh, so far and probably will be. So I think my question to everyone here is also, how can something like the Wikimedia Foundation support living knowledge systems, which you know often are critically endangered around the world, if I can use that phrase, um, rather than be extractive and, cat and to create a power dynamic where it is also strengthening those knowledge systems rather than just extracting from them. That's something I'm, I don't know the answer to and I'd love to hear people's thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we have the answers, but it's good to be in the dialogue. And I, I think, you know, for me, all my doctoral studies looked at, you know, sort of the, the steps that we need to do to reform some of these issues of representation. But, 
you know, as I mentioned before, it's, it's actually shifting the paradigm to more transformative approaches that aren't extractive. I think that's the biggest damage is to build these systems and think that you're saving something where it's actually living somewhere else. And so you need to go to those places where things are living and you need to support communities with the power of, you know, information structures, knowledge management. You know, I think that what we see in Australia is communities crying out for that support, but they also don't want people to take their information away from where it belongs. So I think there's a lot that we can do, but it's kind of being careful about not perpetuating harm in those colonial practices. That's our um, sort of biggest warning. And I think, you know, Nathan and I touched on the data sovereignty movement. It is so vital to this work um, in thinking about data in a much more expansive way and taking responsibility for data governance in ways that people haven't thought about before. Just a really big thanks to Nathan and to Kirsten and, and also to Jack for because I think this is a dialogue, this is what this is about, it's about relationships and the answers are actually in the room, they're not in, you know, um, we need, it's not a, you know, I like that thing Nathan about not taking the deficit gap um, analogy which we do too easily so I think you know it's about what's the positives on both um, both sides and how do we start relating and working together so thank you so much for taking the time we really look forward to the report which we know is a question another just another set of questions that's fantastic thanks everyone <laughs>